my family in Christ. How many of you slept outside last night? Anybody? Maybe, okay, so we all slept inside last night. How many of you slept inside without air conditioning? Nobody? It got, it got like under 90 degrees last night by 2 in the morning probably. Everybody had air conditioning? Okay. Well, then you are fortunate because there are about 25,000 homes as of yesterday in the valley that were still without power after Friday's storm. So 25,000 people who did not get to sleep in their homes or go through the day in their homes with air conditioning. Doesn't sound too pleasant, does it? Now, 25,000 people, in the grand scheme of things, maybe it doesn't even sound like that many. It's kind of a drop in the bucket compared to the millions of people who live in the valley. But do you know whom, to whom 25,000 people sounds like a lot? To, the, to, the peop, to one of those 25,000 people. That's, that's who wishes that it was a much, much smaller number. That's the thing about going through hardships, isn't, isn't it? is that, well, hardships can be very, very abstract. Somebody gets cancer. Somebody has a loved one that dies. Somebody loses their job. Somebody who's struggling in a relationship. All those things can seem really, really abstract until when? It happens to you. And you're the one who deals with it. You're the one who has to visit your child in the hospital. You're the one who's making the call to your siblings that you never thought you'd have to make. You're the one who's wondering about what's happening next in the future. It's really easy. It's really easy to come to church and praise God and talk about the comfort that God brings until you realize you really need it. And that's what Psalm 91 brings us today. It shows us a lot of situations, a lot of realities of hardships, things that are real, things that threaten, and yet the response that a believer gets to have. And the, believer, the response that a believer has isn't a result of how weak those threats are. Because your hardships are hard. The things that threaten you are serious. God doesn't deny those things. The Bible is very realistic about hardships. So the things that threaten you are serious. But the reason you find comfort it's because the reality of the one who comforts you. And as powerful as the threats are in the world, the power of the one who protects you is so much greater. And so we're going to look at Psalm 91 today. And we're going to talk a little bit about the themes that we see there and the reasons why we are comforted. And it's such a beautiful psalm. It's not very long. We're going to read through the whole thing. It's just arranged, arranged in a beautiful way. And so I want you to do a couple of things while I read through the whole thing. It's not printed out in, in its entirety in a worship folder. Those are the main verses we're going to look at. So if you follow along on the, up in the front as, we, as, we, as I read through it, I want you to think about a couple of things. I want you to think about what the theme of Psalm 91 is to you. What stands out as the theme? And I want you to be thinking about a couple of other things. I want you to be thinking about the names that God is called and the way God is described in this psalm. Because maybe that will help kind of direct a theme and kind of create a cohesive picture of who God is to you. And I want you to also be thinking about the things that threaten the problems that the writer brings up. And I want you to maybe think about your own problems and the things that threaten you. Maybe the things that he brings up don't resonate to you and what you're seeing in your life, but I guarantee you that there is something. There is something out there. And in the end, there is one most powerful threat of all that we're going to see in this Psalm 2. And so, um, again, I'm going to read through the whole thing. I want you to be thinking about themes, names, and, and ways of describing God and what that means to you. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. 
A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the word of God. Okay, so if you had to pick maybe a verse or something to stand as a theme of the psalm, what do you think it would be? What would you pick? It seems that verse 1 would be a really good way of summarizing what this psalm is all about. Summarizing, essentially giving a principle for a believer, for somebody who knows God. It says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. The principle being that when you know God, when you rely on him, he is there for you. He is your rest. He is your protection. He is your fortress. He is your shelter. He is how you stay safe. Maybe verse 2 is another way of summarizing the theme of this psalm. See, it gives a couple of names for God here, most high and almighty, right? Most high addressing God's authority over everything. Almighty addressing his power, his ability to carry out his authority. This expresses the fact that we know who God is. Well, verse 2 talks about the response to knowing who God is. What is the response? It's a very small word, but it's a very important word. Trust. Trust is the response of knowing who God is, his authority and his power. And trust is a funny thing, right? Because trust is really easy to talk about. It's very hard to show. Yesterday, maybe you caught a very um, terrifying depiction of trust. Did you guys see the advertisements for a while on the Fox network? The fact that a man named Luke Akins was going to do an aerial jump, 25,000 feet in the air. He was going to jump out of a, a helicopter or a plane. He was going to do a jump out of something that flies. And it was going to be televised. And maybe this doesn't seem like a big deal because people jump out of planes a lot now. But what made this a big deal is that he had a very specific target he had to hit, a 100 foot by 100 foot target. Because that target was a net. It was very important for him to hit that net because Luke Akins was jumping out of a plane without any parachute. Without any sort of flying device. He didn't have a wingsuit either. He had nothing. All he had was a net on the ground. You better believe that he trusted that that net was going to stop him when he hit it. It'd be pretty hard to jump out of a plane 25,000 feet in the air unless you really believed that when you reached the ground, the net was going to stop your fall. I doubt his wife and his four-year-old son would have let him get up in that plane and jump out of it unless they really trusted that that net would hold him when he fell. Well, he jumped yesterday. They almost made him wear a parachute and he jumped. And he made it to the net, and he survived. The net held him. The net was powerful enough. The net worked. It did its job, and it held him. I think what that demonstrates is something called functional trust. And I, and I think I've talked about it before. Functional trust is what you actually put your trust in. It's not what you say you put your trust in. It's what you actually put your trust in. For instance, you may say that you trust God with your future. You may say that you trust God's promises to provide. But if you go to bed at night sleeping much easier, much more confidently because you finally got a raise, what do you put your functional trust in? The promises of God or the money that you receive through your job? 
You see, it might be really easy to say that we trust God to take care of us, but it's probably a lot easier to put our trust in other things like our money. We might say that we trust God to provide for us and our families, but it might be easier when we are in our cars and driving on the freeways and merging in the lanes to put more of our trust in our brakes and our airbags and the safety features of the car rather than the one who controls everything. You see, your functional trust really displays who you are putting your trust in. And maybe, more often than not, we are putting our trust not in the Most High or the Almighty, but the things in front of us. And that can be a dangerous thing. Because the things of this world often fail us. That net that held Luke held him up. Amazing. But what if it didn't? But a lot of things that could have gone wrong with that net, a lot of things. Your job, it provides for your family and helps take care of you, but all kinds of things could go wrong. Where will your trust and confidence for the future be? In your relationships with a spouse or parents or friends, probably provide a lot of your love, a lot of your identity, a lot of your sense of self-value. But what about when those things fluctuate, when struggles arise, when somebody's maybe not around anymore the way they used to be. The things of this world change all the time. And so it's really important, it's really important for us to say, in whom do I trust? In whom do I really trust? It's doubly important when we realize that the things that change and affect our world, well, there's a lot more to it than just the threats that we feel and touch and perceive with our eyes. There's a lot more to what's going on. Here's the way that the psalmist brings it up. He says, You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. He talks about all the thi- a variety of things that threaten, things that you can see, that you can touch, threats of armies, threats of disease, all these different things. Do you notice kind of what times of day he talks about these things happening? Kind of the full picture, right? He talks about things happening in darkness, things happening during the daytime. And really how threats kind of are always there. There's always the threat of something coming. And so it's kind of intimidating to think of how are we really ever safe? And maybe you struggle with anxiety. Maybe you struggle with weary, worry as you wonder about all the different things that can threaten you, things that can harm you. And so maybe, maybe it speaks strongly to, you, strongly to you as you think about how God talks about himself. The fact that he is a refuge and a fortress. The fact that he's strong that he's impregnable, that nothing can knock him down. Maybe that speaks a lot to you as you think about all the different threats happening in the world. We've been looking at a lot of them lately, haven't we? We've looked at mass shootings. We've looked at terrorist attacks. We've talked about all these different things happening in the world. And so maybe for you, the fact that God is a fortress that blocks out all those things, maybe that speaks strongly to you because that is God. He is strong. He is the Almighty. But did you notice another picture that he uses to describe his protection? It almost seems a little counterintuitive to the picture of a strong and mighty fortress. He uses this picture too. He says, He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. How does, how is God described here? His mighty walls and a shield and fortress? Or how is he described here? It's feathers and wings, right? Something very fragile, something very soft. And so it's a little bit of a different image than just God being strong and mighty. There's also this image of a mother bird who sees the elements are ready to harm her children, the heat of the sun or the cold wind, and she lifts up her wings and uses her wings to shield her young. So her young stays safe, but what happens to the mother? The mother takes the heat of the sun. The mother takes the coldness of the wind on her fragile wings. 
You see, God and his protection for us isn't just that of a mighty power, a building, but it's also one of sacrifice. It's one of nurture, one of faithfulness, that he will actually be there to do it. And so God is, is both things that you need. He's both the power, but he's also the one who's willing to sacrifice everything about him to use that power for you. And that's very important as we look at the root of our problems, the root of our worst dangers in this world. It's not just the things that we see and that we touch, but it's something else that comes up that the Apostle Paul reminds us of in Ephesians. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Does this strike you as a little bit of a wake-up call? That so often what we're concerned of are those armies and terrorists on the other side of the world that are knocking on our doorsteps sometimes. So often we're concerned about those people that have the problems in life, that are causing problems in our society. So often we're concerned about those people out there that if we just legislate enough or if we carry enough guns on ourselves, we'll finally be able to feel safe, feel rest, feel protected. What are we reminded of? That there's a lot more to it than that. There are enemies that guns can't beat. There are enemies that government legislation can't control. There are a lot worse things. There are a lot worse things out there for us to understand we are threatened by. And so maybe to a certain extent, part of understanding trust is to understand that we need trust. You see, it's easy to face the threats of life if we think we can handle them on our own. And so often we make ourselves do that, don't we? It's a common thing for us to do. Think of, think of the hikers that you've heard about in Arizona recently and how easy it is to think you can handle something that surprises you. Think of those teens who climbed, climbed Mount Humphrey or Humphrey's Peak around the Tucson area not too long ago. The teens that when they got up past the tree line towards the top and a storm blew in, as they often blow in very unexpectedly, and thinking that it was just going to be rain and fine and they were going to handle it, and what happened to one of them? Because they're out in the open, they had no shelter to speak of, nothing to protect them, what happened? One of them was struck by lightning and died. Or think of not too long ago, about a month ago, the end of June when we had that horrible weekend of about 120 degree weather. People were still going out and hiking and biking. That weekend, five people died. Not because, not because they were attacked by anything, but because they didn't have the water that they needed. They didn't have the shade that they needed to handle the onslaught of the powerful sun. What threats do you perceive in your life and how Are you protected against them? What is your shelter against what you know threatens you? What's your shelter against not just your anxiety for the future, but the anxiety that's fueled by Satan? Yeah. The anxiety that's fueled by the devil who wants to separate you from your God because he does. In the psalm, it talks about the fowler's snare. Who do you think that's referring to? Referring to the one that wants to capture you. The one that uses any and all lies, any and all means to separate you from your life, which is your God. You can use any number of things. Make no mistake, that power is behind the threats of this world that make us fear so many things. He's behind those terrorist attacks that make us fear the future. It leads us to hate people. He's behind all the things that lead to racism and struggles with, our, with each other inside of a society. He's all behind all the things that happen and threaten a church. Yes, even inside of a church. He's behind those ways that make us say things that the Bible doesn't say. He's behind all those temptations to tell somebody what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. He's behind all those times where we know we need to be connected to God's word, connected to God in a close way, and yet 
we ignore those opportunities. Make no mistake that the fowler's snare is always set up and in front of you. There's a reason why the Bible describes him as a snake, he's sneaky and crafty, venomous, as a lion who's powerful, who's out hunting, who needs his hunger satisfied. That snare, that fowler, is always ready for you. Not other people. Not just other people, but for you. What is your shelter against that? I pray that your shelter is the God who is both powerful and sacrificial. The God who both knows the pains that we go through, the threats that we have, he knows them so well that he took them within himself. The one who is willing to sacrifice his life so that you wouldn't have to be threatened, fear the threats of not just the world, but of the devil himself. The one who used his power to tackle that foul or that worst of foes and to actually, in a real way, beat him. So that to you, he is now powerless. This is how the writer of the Hebrews talks about that one that we actually trust in. He said, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, that is Christ, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. You see, as you see the threats of this world, you have the one who took on that flesh, those fleshy wings, and shielded you from all its onslaughts, who took the attacks of the whip and of the cross and of the nails and of all the punishment that sin, sin brings with it. He took all of it with him on the cross. And he didn't stay there. He didn't stay there broken down with his wings bleeding. He rose up as a mighty fortress and beat back the devil. He beat back the worst of the powers of this world Shields us from the worst of onslaughts. Guilt can't control us because we have forgiveness. Fear of the future can't control us because we know our home is heaven and that cannot be taken away from us. We have our fortress. We have our mother bird. We have our comfort. A comfort that we can't find anywhere else. And so I pray your shelter is the one who can actually give you shelter. I pray your shelter is the Almighty, the Most High. I pray your shelter is the Savior, the Commander of Angels, the one who sends out all of his powers, use all of, uses all of his powers for you. The one who took on flesh and blood for you. One who encompasses everything in your life. Because that's what a shelter is, right? It's life. A shelter isn't a thing that we visit every once in a while or, or a thing that we leave behind on a regular basis. No, a shelter is a place we live in. Shelter is our home. It's where we feel more, most comfortable. It's the place that we nurture ourselves, that we are nurtured. It's a place we go to, not just in times of hardships, but times of joy. Our shelter is the place that encompasses everything about us. Where is your shelter? I pray it's the one that's made up of, of harder bricks than anything that the world can create. I pray it's the one that can nurture you and comfort you unlike anything else can. Don't look for other shelters. Know. Know your shelter. Know the shelter that you can trust. The shelter you can fall in no matter what. Shelter of the Most High, the shelter of the Almighty. Amen. Please pray with me now. Your Heavenly Father, how easy it is to say we trust in you, but we ask that you instill trust in us because we know who you are. You are the Almighty. You are the Most High, the one who commands all things, the one who defeats and controls all things, even defeats the devil for us. We stand before you as children washed clean by your cross, washed clean and protected by your wings. Help us to live in you always, not just sometimes, but always. It's our comfort, our true comfort, comes so totally and completely from you. In your name we pray, amen.